All right, Ben. How about we、uh, get started by applauding ourselves this time?、Uh, for <laughs> for once, we are recording the episode the day after the release dropped. Great, and then we're going to edit it for about two weeks, and then it'll be totally stale by then. Yeah, we're going to release it、uh, same day as One Forty Two is released. Excellent,、actually. it's a plan.、Um, so today we are talking about Rust One Forty One. It's pretty exciting. I think so. I mean, maybe not as exciting as some previous releases, but again, as we've mentioned before, not every release has to be super exciting.、Uh, it's maybe a good thing, a sign of maturity, to start having just like normal, regular、eh, releases. But I mean, every release gives you like improvements to. Various like bug fixes and compiler things. It's not all about features. Well, one thing actually that I like about this release is it really feels as though it's like a let's tidy some things up that have been like loose ends. This is something that I think came through a little bit in the in the Rust 2020 blog post series of like something the community wanted was to see more sort of. Finish things as opposed to start new ones, and and this has a bit of that flavor to me,、mm-hmm. which is nice. Yeah. And there are always like you know hundreds and hundreds of commits in every release, but not all of them are going to be like big and flashy. A lot of them are just like burning down bugs or implementing new things for future features as well. Future features, you future, say? Future, no, future features. <laughs> I see. But, I mean, I guess there are maybe some future futures features in there too. <laughs> yeah, it's true.、Um, before we dive in, though, I I just briefly want to sort of re mention for those who uh, are uh, only recently have joined、uh, the podcast, which is this is a community podcast.、Uh, it is not just Ben and me talking about、uh, new Rust releases. Um, in particular, this is sort of a community effort where not only can you、um, help us by sort of contributing your own episodes or ideas for episodes, or if you want to do sort of interviews, and we can help you get set up with that. But also, if you want to help with any of the stuff that happens behind the scenes, like、uh, if you know audio editing, for example, then join in, like jump into the Discord channel we have, and then like. You could help out that way too, and it be this is sort of something we all make together. And the more people help, the the better the end product ends up. And shall we dive in? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, what's up first? First up is relaxed restrictions when implementing traits. So this has to do with trait coherence, which is kind of a notion that a lot of people don't want to think about. It's a thing they understand vaguely. Where okay, I have a trait, I have a type, but sometimes I just can't implement that trait for that type. Do you want to go into what trait coherence is and just talk about why it's there, what it's there to do? Yeah, I think I think it's useful to give at least some of the intuition for why there are even rules around this, like when different traits can implement different、uh, types、um, or traits in particular. So the thinking here is、um, you end you can end up in some really weird. Uh, positions as the compiler. If you don't have some rules about who's allowed to do what, in particular,、um, imagine that、uh, there is some crate. Let's use hash brown as an example, which is the the sort of new fancy hash map implementation.、Um, imagine that it did not implement、uh, certy serialize. And then you have two sort of unrelated crates that both want to use the hash brown map,、um, and they both want to be able to serialize it. And so they implement serialize for the hash brown hash map. Let's imagine that that was totally allowed.、Um, and then Ben comes along, and you Ben, you write your own crate, and you depend on both of those crates, and you include a map in whatever type you're writing, and then you want to serialize that. The compiler now has a problem. It has two possible implementations of serialize for the hash brown hash map, and it doesn't know which one to pick. Right, it could choose the one that whoever wrote crate A that you depend on wrote, or the one that whoever wrote crate B dep- that you depend on wrote,、um, but it doesn't know which one to pick. And different languages have different approaches to this.、Um, in Rust, we use coherence, in which the compiler enforces that there is only ever one choice, and the way it does that is by limiting which crates are allowed to implement which traits for which types. Yeah. So effectively, as a library author, you'd be the one who'd be dealing with this issue, and so you would never get to the point where a user would figure out, "Hey, I can't actually use this crate with this crate because they both do this thing," because each individual library would hit this error before they could ever compile their code. Yeah. Exactly. So in in the example we gave before, if one of these sort of intermediate crates tried to implement the serialize trait. Which is a foreign trait to that crate. It's not implemented in that crate. It's implemented in the certy crate, 
and then they tried to implement that trait for hash brown hash map, which is a foreign type, then the compiler would say, you're trying to implement a foreign trait for a foreign type, and you are not allowed to do that. Uh, and of course, this might be frustrating if you're the developer of that library because you need sturdy serialize. Um, but this is what the compiler does to ensure that you don't end up in these positions where you don't know which implementation to choose. And that's what coherence is, but it's still sometimes kind of annoying, understandably. And so in this new release, we have some relaxation of the coherence rules. And so do you want to go over what that means? Yeah, we can. I think it's useful to go through that quickly. Um, I, I want to point out before we dive into it that at the bottom of the few paragraphs in the release notes about this, there's a link to the RFC that proposed this change. Um, and I think that RFC is really well written uh, in terms of uh, making you understand both why this is necessary and also why this relaxation is is um, is useful uh, and why it's sort of both uh, sufficient and necessary um, for things that people want to do in practice. And the example that they give in the release notes, I think, is, is a good one, which is um, imagine that you want to implement, so generic over T, you want to implement from your VEC of T for VEC of T. And from is a trait defined in standard library, and as is VEC is a type defined in standard library. So you don't own, oh, you don't own either of those. Exactly. So this is an instance of the pattern, which is you implement some foreign trait for some foreign type. And previously, this was just not allowed. You just could not write this. And this is awkward because sometimes you really want to say that you can turn my type into some other type. And you don't control the other type and you don't control the from trait. And so you don't have any, any way to do this. Um, what this RFC proposed that is now sort of landed on stable is essentially to relax the rules in such a way that we can still guarantee that there is only ever one implementation for the compiler to choose from. Um, and the way they do that is to simplify it greatly, um, is to say that you are allowed to have an implementation of a foreign trait for a foreign type if... Um, the you have at least one local type that appears in the foreign traits type arguments and it appears to the left in that list it's just the first one in the list essentially um it, it can be multiple too um you're, okay. it just the leading type parameters of the trait have to be local um and if there are any generic parameters that appear in the type you're implementing the trait for, then they need to be covered. That is, they need to appear in uh, as type parameters to that type. And the rules here might seem somewhat arbitrary, like why do they choose these rules? And the, the RFC is really good about going through this and what like covered means and why it's necessary. But to give, try to give some intuition here, it doesn't really matter whether your local type is sort of to the left or to the right. The RFC just chose one essentially at random. But the reason you want to do this is um, if every crate is held to the same standard of your local types have to appear to the left, then you can't have two crates that accidentally overlap in their implementation. For example, imagine that um, Ben's crate implements from um, his type, comma, generic type parameter T, and my crate implements from generic type parameter T, my type, then those two implementations are technically overlapping because my T could be his type or his T could be my type. And so as long as the compiler enforces that all the local type parameters appear to the left, then these would automatically be seen as overlapping by the compiler, uh, as non-overlapping by the compiler because they couldn't possibly overlap. Yeah, it seems a little bit ad hoc, but it still works out at the end. It's mostly there kind of like just to, as a convenience. I don't think people are really going to nick, again, most folks don't really understand what coherence like does or the rules for it and like in this case kind of just making things work more the way you want them to work yeah so. exactly and if anything the discussion here is mostly to tell you that there is such a thing as coherence yes there is a good reason why the compiler prevents you from compiling some of these uh, impulse that you want to write and you really should go read the rfc if this is something that that you find interesting so what's up next? We have cargo install updates packages when outdated. What is cargo install? Is that like, I've seen some confusion online where people have been now learning about cargo install and they're like, well, does that like actually like put dependencies inside my project or something? And no, cargo install is a uh, subcommand that comes with cargo by default. 
uh, and it is used to install binaries from crates.io. I'm not sure if you can get it from other locations, but for example, uh, what's mostly used for if somebody wants to, say, add a new subcommand to cargo, cargo blank, uh, then you would be able to install that from crates.io by running cargo install. Uh, and so previously, uh, there was no real built-in way to get updates for any packages that you had installed through cargo install. Uh, there were, in fact, packages you could install with Cargo Install that, when, when run, would update your packages installed with Cargo Install. Uh, but now those are obsolete. Now Cargo Install is just, uh, when you run it, it will update any binaries that you have installed through Cargo Install. It's kind of like a little lightweight package manager just for extending Cargo itself. Yeah, I don't know whether it will actually... I don't know if you can run Cargo Install without any arguments and then have it like update everything you've installed. I think you still have to give the name for a package. I think so, yeah. So you can do like Cargo Install Foo, and then in the past, if you later ran Cargo Install Foo again, it would just say Foo is already installed, no matter which version you had installed and which version was the latest. Whereas now, if you run Cargo Install Foo, it will update Foo if its version is newer. Previously, the only real way to do this was with the dash dash force flag, which just installed foo again and replaced the old one, regardless of what the new version was, like even if it was the same version. Um, th there's one thing I want to mention about cargo install, which is um, Ben mentioned that it installs from crates.io, and that is true. There is a way to install something that's not on crates.io. Uh, so you can, with cargo install, you can give dash dash path and then a path to um, a cargo repository, and it will install the binaries from that repository. Uh, or you can do cargo install dash dash git and give a, a git URL, and then we'll clone that and build it. Cool. And this, this can be useful if you want to run um, like the master version of some particular binary, like they've implemented a feature and you want to test that out before it's been released. Next on the list is the less conflict-prone cargo.lock format. And this is actually uh, kind of a bait-and-switch, a sleight of hand, if you will, because this is not a new feature. We actually talked about this feature back in our 1.38 episode. What's new about it this time is that this new cargo.lock format is now on by default, uh, which is also still kind of misleading because it is only used if you make a brand new project. If cargo does not find a lock file in your project, then it will generate using this new format Otherwise, it will respect the old format. And why would we want to have it for the past like three or four releases but not actually have it turned on? Well, I mean, I think this is partially just you want to be careful about introducing very new features without having them tested a lot first. I think in my case, the reason, uh, the reason that I understand it is that uh, you don't want people uh, on older tool chains to get kind of like blindsided by this new format. Say they are using a dependency... Uh, that happens to just run, uh, you know, erase their lock file and then make a new one. Uh, but their version of the tool chain, the consumer's version of the tool chain, doesn't yet understand it. And so if you're on like an older version of Rust, uh, and then people start using this new version of the lock file, they might not even know they're doing it, is the thing too, if you just happen to like blow away a lock file somehow. Uh, and so the idea is just to be polite to people who don't update like totally in lockstep. Now, as long as you've updated any time since uh, July, August or so, which is when 138 came out, uh, then you will uh, understand any new lock files generated by this. And so mostly it was there to get the knowledge of the new lock file into Rust, even though it wasn't being used yet. Uh, if you are using an older version like 37 or earlier, uh, now might be a time to uh, think about upgrading just because you might start getting some strange errors about like, hey, like this lock file is corrupt or I'm not sure what the actual error looks like, but yeah. I see. So it, it was really sort of a forwards compatibility thing of like, we want to land understanding this format before we even think about standardizing it. Like you might never see this in practice, but for, for future users, we want to make it sure. Mm -hmm. It's one of those like strange things where, for example, uh, in the Rust compiler, because Rust is a bootstrapping compiler that is built in Rust, one of the consequences is that you can't actually use new features in the compiler until the feature is in the previous version of the compiler. So you can implement the feature, but you can't actually use it until you actually build the compiler with itself. So, so should I immediately remove all my cargo lock files and then rebuild them? Uh, there's certainly nothing stopping you. And I mean, uh, if you read a library, understand that this will increase potentially the minimum uh, Rust version of your library to 1.38. I know these days, if you're like in the async ecosystem, then you're definitely on or hopefully on 1.39 by now with the async await. 
Uh, but there are some libraries out there that do try to have like rigid or you know very uh, diligently adhere to certain minimum uh, Rust version standards. I think Regex is one of them, that kind of thing, or generally very like widely used ones try and have a uh, some amount of care taken for uh, users on older versions. So I mean, you can if you want to. Maybe there are other reasons that you've already like if you're using async await and there's no reason not to, for example. Uh, but it's up to you. I think I kind of like it a lot. Um, we want to go. Which we actually we should go over what it does. In fact, and yeah, I was so, about to ask. Like, why do why I even we, have why lock files? Care? Yeah. Um, so in this case, the idea is a good. It's a good RFC too. Again, explaining what this does. But the idea is that uh, if you are on, working on a project that has a lock file, so a binary release of some kind, um, then you have multiple developers kind of like committing to uh, the same. Lock file. If they, may, if they both have branches where they both make changes, like say they both add a dependency to the lock file. In the previous version of the lock file format, the way it worked was um, you essentially you have like one section where it's like here are all your crates. Here's like you know the crate name, and then kind of a little JSON like the crates version, uh, the crates like metadata that kind of stuff. Uh, but all the crates in your project in the lock file also have what's called a crate hash. The idea is that we just hash. Uh, the crate and kind of do a sanity check of hang, saying, hey, like, so we're making sure that uh, whenever you grab uh, a version of this crate, we'll hash the source and figure out if anything's gone wrong. Kind of just a little bit, little security measure, uh, which is uh, a very nice little thing. Uh, but previously, those hashes, for whatever reason, weren't stored in line with all of the uh, various uh, information for each crate. They were all stored together in one big hash blob at the bottom of the file. And the way that Git works is that if any two changes to like lines that are like within some distance of each other change, then it'll give you a conflict. And so you would get like all kinds of like version conflicts of trying to merge it. Hey, like this thing has changed, but actually it really shouldn't have mattered. Obviously, if you both change, if two branches change the same crate, you want to get a conflict, and you still will in this case, obviously, because you've changed the same lines. But now uh, lines should be far enough apart that this isn't a problem. Uh, at least, hopefully not. And there's also a few other, other uh, changes, too. Here, just uh, reducing some redundancy, making there be less churn in general in the lock file, just to hopefully also reduce chances of uh, certain conflicts happening. Do you want to talk a little bit about what a lock file even is? Like, why do we have lock files? Um, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> sure. As, so lock files are... Um, they're a way to get... The, they, they buy you a couple of things. A lock file essentially notes down which exact version of every dependency you have you are currently using. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons why you might want to do that. One of them is for reproducible builds. Um, so if I build my crate and it builds correctly and everything runs fine, then I can publish my crate and the lock file and then sort of know that anyone who tries to also install whatever that crate is, they will get the same version, it will build the same way, it will perform the same way. Um, if I didn't include the lock file, they might get a later version of whatever things I depend on. And although that shouldn't break anything, sometimes it does, sometimes it's a bug or a performance regression. Uh, so that is one reason. Or maybe I publish a, like a hash of the binary that gets produced so other people can check that they got the true same thing that I got when I built. And then you certainly want the same um, underlying dependencies to be used. The other reason to use a lock file is um, the, to some extent, at least, for security. Like, you might care that I have reviewed this version of this crate, and I know it doesn't have any security vulnerabilities in it, um, and I will update that when I have rev reviewed the newer version. Uh, if I didn't include a lock file, you might get a later version that, like, someone has introduced malware into or something, uh, and that is sort of a secondary concern that people use with lock files. So yeah, kind of a minor thing, but I think like for people who work on like projects with many contributors, it's actually a pretty nice uh, quality of life change. I think there, are, I think it was maybe inspired by I know like a year or two ago. I saw I think Facebook was doing something with Rust, and uh, one of their like problems was they just weren't committing the lock file. Generally, with binaries, you'll commit libraries you won't. And for their binary, they were trying to do like really weird things of like not committing it and writing their own like uh, tools to try and like deal with conflicts. And I was like, why are you doing this? Just commit the lock file. And they were like, well, we have like a million developers all trying to fit to the same mono repo and having all these conflicts. And in that, that, in that case, it is just definitely a pain. And so hopefully this reduces that pain. There's actually one more reason I just thought of now that you mentioned that, which is a lock file means that um, you probably don't have to recompile dependencies quite as often. Because otherwise, like you, if you don't have a lock file, then 
Cargo is just going to like check for updates every time, and then there are probably a bunch of point updates for a bunch of your dependencies, and then it's going to fetch those and then rebuild that depend part of the dependency graph and rebuild your library on top of it. With a lock file, it doesn't have to do that unless you explicitly say you want to update your dependencies. Mm. So next, there's a, a lot item called more guarantees when using boxes in FFI. And so I think the, the actual the change itself isn't quite that interesting. Uh, we can go over that definitely, but I do want to talk about too about like what we do with like FFI types. Like what does it mean for us to say like, hey, this type on the Rust side is compatible with a type on the C side? Do you want to go through what about this, the box TFFI change real quick? Yeah. So th this is a th this is sort of a change that I think many people assumed was the case already, which is that. If you have a, a heap pointer in Rust, so a box T, uh, and specifically one where T is sized, so it's not um, like a uh, virtual, virtual dynamic dispatch pointer, like it's not a DIN trait box, it is just a box of some type that is sized, um, then what Rust now guarantees is that that type can just be cast to a raw pointer and then be given to C and it's fine to use as if it were just like a T star in C. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in the past, people just assumed that this was the case. But now, in some sense, like the Rust team has like gone through and checked that this is actually the case and that this is something they do want to guarantee going forward. Yeah, that's kind of what I want to talk about, too, with regard to some of these guarantees that you know the Rust team will say, hey, like this type is compatible. Because I don't believe it actually involves any source code changes. This is kind of a social contract. Uh, people will... <clears throat> pardon me people will tend to use uh, certain types on the Rust side and say, hey, like, you know, as in my mind, a box T is just a pointer to a type. And so I'm going to kind of like, it, this should be compatible. And it should be. A box is just like, you know, it is an address to the heap. And C just has pointers, which addresses to anything. So it is compatible, like, conceptually. But, like, compilers are hard. And we can't always, you know, take things for granted. And so sometimes it's nice for the Rust, like, language team uh, to say, hey, like, yes, we will make sure to always guarantee that if you use a box in this way, according to these kind of like a few uh, restrictions, like the size restriction and so on, that uh, it will always just work. There won't be like any like weird unsafety, uh, at least not from this. There's still plenty of things that can go wrong with FFI. Uh, but we have other things in Rust too that exhibit the same features. And so, for example, uh, reference to an option of T. Uh, is guaranteed by Rust to be compatible with a nullable pointer, correct? Uh, an option reference T. That's, that's it, yeah. I don't know whether a reference to an option Sorry. of a T has the same guarantee. Other way around. But, like, there are things that we kind of, like, guarantee in Rust. There's no, like, there's no attribute, as far as I know, that says, hey, like, you know, make sure this is true. It's just something that uh, would exist in a theoretical Rust specific, uh, specification. It might be in the, uh, the reference manual. I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, there are certain things that are just, like, social contracts uh, that are part of the language that we can't, like, really enforce. It's kind of just, like, one of those, like, unsafe things that, hey, like, let's now say, hey, like, we have a policy on the compiler of we won't do any weird optimization that would break this. Yeah, and I think this is this matters in particular for people writing unsafe code where it, once you write unsafe code, like, there are all these... The, this exact specification matters a lot to you. And this is why it, it matters whether or not the compiler gives this guarantee because that dictates whether you're allowed to do something in unsafe code or not. So for example, the, the reason why there's a restriction on the T in box T having to be sized for this to be true is because if you have, for example, a box DIN trait, then that is actually a fat pointer in Rust. It is not just a normal pointer. And so casting it to a pointer in C would not be legal. It would not produce correct results. And so this is why you really want the, the, the compiler team or the Lang team, I guess, to sit down and figure out what are the, the language guarantees that we give you for this type. You'll notice there's a, um, I don't think it's linked in the release notes, but we'll do it in the in the notes for this episode, which is there's something called the uh, Rust Unsafe Code Guidelines Working Group, which are, they're basically going through all of the various things you might care about in Unsafe and figuring out what are the actual rules, like rules around alignment of fields, rules around padding, um, uninitialized memory, alignment of pointers, like all of this stuff and trying to nail down what is the specification? What are the, the guarantees that you can rely on when writing unsafe code? 
And speaking of the unsafe uh, guidelines working group, one related work is the whole thing with the Miri interpreter. And uh, we have an episode with an interview that I did with uh, an author or a contributor to Miri. Uh, look back in our backlog for that. It's one of the uh, Rust Fest interviews. And Miri is a pretty cool tool that can uh, dynamically detect undefined behavior from within your Rust code. So kind of like a sanitizer for... Uh, any kind of like clang, they have like the val grind and uh, mem- upsan and asan and tsan, and so hopefully this should be a, a one-stop shop for all kinds of rust things, and it should also hopefully be uh, comprehensive, like no false positives, no false negatives, uh, still dynamic, obviously, so not quite up to the uh, the rust ideal, but it'll be good to be able to say, hey, like I ran my test kit suite over this with Miri and didn't find any undefined behavior, so it gives me some confidence that this particular thing. Uh, this unsafe code that I've written actually is safe. Yeah, I think if you're writing any unsafe code in your library, your CI should probably include a Miri test. It's just like, just do it. It's relatively easy to set up. It is not that slow to run unless you have particularly weird code. uh, And it it just is going to save you from a lot of worrying. Uh, A few library changes this time. No constification. Sadly, no Aww. things became const this time. Maybe next time. <laughs> uh, but uh, a few, one thing I want to talk about is kind of uh, there is a type in Rust called non-zero. And there are, these are uh, integer types. The idea being that uh, if you use these types, uh, that the value of these types will never be zero. Uh, which they exist for interesting reasons. They are good for optimizations, uh, certainly. The idea being that we mentioned option before, where uh, option has about the sum and a num case, and in the case of like an option to a point, a reference to t, uh, you can kind of squirrel away the nun case into uh, the null, like the zero, zero, zero uh, case. Uh, and then that means that you can always apply optimization where uh, you can represent that option to a pointer to t as just a pointer to t. And so there's no memory overhead at all to this, which is really important for uh, certain, like both passing things as if to FFI, but also just for general optimizations of not using up more memory than you need. Uh, one of those examples of zero cost abstractions. And uh, I think this actually was inspired by Servo's use case. The idea of being, hey, like we also have like these options to numbers, uh, these like, integers, and we know we can guarantee that these won't ever be zero. Uh, and so we would like it to not use up like an extra byte of memory just for uh, representing the option of these numbers, just to give us some extra type safety without any extra like runtime penalty. And in fact, it's probably even more than that. It's not just a byte; it's like a full padding and alignment. Yeah, that which type. is actually so. If you have like a U64, you'd have to like you know pad. You have double the size of the type, effectively. Uh, and so those aren't new. The non-zero types themselves aren't new. Uh, but now uh, they implement from non-zero of a smaller type uh, if those integers. <laughs> Uh, if the smaller type, or if the type is smaller. And so, for example, a non-zero U16 now implements from non-zero U8. And the reason I want to call this out is because there's kind of a uh, a mirror thing where this just happens to work even without the non-zero types. And so the U16 type in the standard library implements from U8, uh, and so it's totally lossless, and you might be used to uh, doing this just using the as keyword. Uh, and I think the as keyword is kind of like, if we were ever to do like a retrospective of like Rust, of things we would do differently, it might, we might not have the as keyword, frankly, just because uh, it doesn't cause any problems in this case, but it's kind of poor for error handling and also for going between some different types. It is less than ideal, specifically like with we're going to uh, floats to integers and integers to floats. There is some gnarly undefined behavior that is still to these this day, kind of like vaguely lurking in the background. I think it is the oldest open uh, unsound issue. Issue tagged as unsound. And the bug tracker is about converting from integers to floats just because of certain semantics of LLVM and floating point. And it's, it's hard to do to resolve without also imposing some runtime overhead. And so it's kind of like, eh, maybe we shouldn't have used as in the first place for this. Uh, so yeah, consider using... Uh, from and into for these uh, numeric conversions. This is also something that the Unsafe Code Guidelines Working Group, that's far too long, uh, is looking at (laughs) is stuff like what what are legal bit representations of different types? Like, for example, should we require that the only valid bit patterns for Boolean true and false are zero and one? That is true, I'm pretty sure. I think that is also true. Mm -hmm. um, But they have to go through this for a number of different types. And and things like casting a number to a float is another instance of like, do you end up with 
pattern that's undefined or is this supposed to be de defined behavior? And if so, what kind of defined behavior? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of also like, yeah, again, what ties into the, uh, the maybe an init type that we got a few releases back, which is again inspired by the working group things of saying, hey, like some of the ways we're currently doing things are just totally bogus. Uh, we should have a different way of doing things. And so Rust is getting safer slowly. Uh, Rust is also... Unsafe Rust is getting safer. <laughs> Hopefully safe Rust uh, is as safe as ever. Not getting... Was never, we're not implying that it was ever unsafe. Or was it? Dun, dun, dun. dun, dun, dun. Um, speaking of uh, numbers, uh, there's another number that's soon <laughs> going away, <laughs> which is that uh, the Rust compiler is going to remove or reduce support for 32-bit Apple targets in the next release. How do you feel about this? You heard it here. Rust is now removing support for 32-bit numbers entirely. Yep. U16 to U64. Just right, going right over it. Well, so. U, U16 is fine, and U64 are fine. You <laughs> yeah, just yeah. can't use U32. No, but I really, I don't really understand. Like, I'm not an Apple person, and so I don't know how old the hardware is. Uh, that, like, what, when was the last, like, 32-bit Apple thing released? I don't even know. Many years ago. Because I think the reason we're doing this is not because we really want to. I think it's LLVM is just removing support for it, potentially. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's kind of just like, hey, like, we're just marching forward the endless march of, quote-unquote, progress. I don't know. So well, I don't think it, they're not. It's not that they're saying we're going to remove support. It's that it's no longer going to be like a top tier supported target. Mm -hmm. uh, so like in all likelihood, it'll keep working, but it won't be a goal to still support it. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll also be like if it works, it works. Yeah. So one thing that got um, buried, or not buried, but one thing that was noted here in addition to just the links um, is this link to a blog post from the Inside Rust blog, which is like a blog for the people who care more about the internals uh, of the compiler um, that talks about constant propagation. And th this is a really cool thing that has just landed in 141. And it, it's sort of the, the start of a longer process that's ongoing. At, at its core, constant propagation is really just... If you have some values that you know are constant, uh, and then you see some operations on those values, then you might be able to just replace that computation as well with the result of the, of the constant computation. The idea here is to evaluate anything you can at compile time. Um, what gets really cool in this particular re release is that you can propagate this into control flow as well. So one example that they give in the in the linked blog post is if imagine that you have some constant that's like an option u8, and somewhere in your file you set it equal to like sum of twelve, and then later in your code you have like a match on that constant where if it's none you mark it as like unreachable, and if it's sum then you do something with it. Well, with constant propagation, you can eliminate that entire branch at compile time because the compiler knows that that constant is sum, so it doesn't even need to evaluate the sort of conditional on whether this is none or sum. It could just proceed with assuming that it's sum uh, and evaluate that at compile time. And the reason this matters is because it means that we can produce less code to give to LLVM which is sort of the, the underlying thing that turns the Rust MIR into executable machine code. And it turns out that one of the big bottlenecks for Rust compilation at the moment is that LLVM compilation phase. And so if we can give less, less code to LLVM, then LLVM also runs faster, and so the whole Rust comp compilation process goes faster. Yeah, I was surprised too, because I mean, obviously the impetus for this is going to be originally kind of like, hey, by doing more things at compile time, we can do less things at runtime and therefore produce like faster code at runtime or faster code that, code that runs faster at runtime. Uh, and in this case, but you would always suspect, hey, like, but we're doing more at compile time, so actually it's going to like be worse for performance, and we don't want that really. Uh, but it, surprisingly, it actually is better for performance. So in the benchmarks, I said a 2 to 10% improvement on a variety of test cases in both debug and release mode. And so by just generating better code in this case, uh, or less worse code in this case, by doing more operations at compile time, we actually improve compile time in the I, end. I think maybe the intuition here is that... Uh, Whenever you go down the level, so like from MIR to LLVMIR, for example, um, you're sort of removing information that could be used to do something smarter. So it's true that we're sort of now doing some logic in MIR that could be done in LLVM instead. But in the MIR level, we have more of this information. We know more about the guarantees and and um, the invariants that 
exist in MIR and in Rust code that means that you can pretty efficiently do this constant propagation, whereas it would be a little bit harder in LLVM because you have relaxed guarantees about your input. Some other things that were a little bit buried in the lead here of um, sort of Rust and cargo changes is that Cargo now has support for what are known as profile overrides. Uh, and you seem particularly excited by this, Ben. What, what was the use case you had in mind? Well, I think just in my case, I have a Rust project, again, which mentioned, we just mentioned a pile of times. Uh, and so in this case, uh, there's kind of a longer story here with regard to like, just talking to like, you know, D. Tolne, so the author of Surdy, and kind of like worrying about, hey, like, if I'm a library author and I happen to use Surdy, uh, to generate some code that then a consumer of my library, why should they need to also like get the dependency on survey and then compile that and then like run that just to get some extra code? I mean, I could theoretically just like copy paste this code into my project and they wouldn't even need survey, would they? And so as the author of survey, David Tolney is obviously kind of sensitive to this. And so he has a few things like there's a, a thing called what of his, which is kind of, I think, an, an WASM interpreter, which you would then include as an, an alternative to installing Surday. And so apparently in his test, it's a lot faster, which is kind of like insane, but like to, it makes sense. You would have like, you would be interpreting this thing as opposed to compiling and then running this thing, which can be faster generally. Uh, if you are only you know, running very little code, but compiling a lot of code, for example. And so an alternative in this case is that now with Cargo, uh, there's a few uh, extra little features. We'll add a, li a uh, link to documentation to go over it more, but now you can say, hey, like for certain dependencies, I want to, like anywhere in my crates uh, dependency graph, like transitively or directly, I want to say, hey, like, you know, build this with a certain optimization flag or any of the various flags, although I think the opt level is the biggest, most one that people are most excited about. And so one of the, the uh, things that you can override is the just build override, uh, and that which uh, changes any um, build scripts, any uh, proc macro stuff to or you can then apply to whatever you want, like so like op level zero, for example. And so this may or may not uh, change the speed of your compilation. And so uh, one thing to mention, too, is that like if you change optimization level of your procedural macros, you're not changing the speed of uh, your final binary, because you are just changing the speed with which some library generates the exact same code that then goes into your final binary, because of the whole like the code gen separation here with what Surday does and how it works. Uh, and so, for example, I'm just reading the uh, the Reddit comments here of like someone like someone tried changing their build override to not optimize at all, and they got like a five percent gain. Someone else tried it and they got like a like they cut their time in half, for example. And so, it really depends on the like what your code looks like, I think. So, should you should experiment and see, for example, if this improves uh, your compile times. Yeah, I mean, the, the thinking here is you might have tried to do something like a cargo check or a cargo test uh, or a cargo build, I guess, is the most obvious example. You run cargo build and it takes some amount of time. And then you run cargo build dash dash release and it takes a longer amount of time. And the difference between those two is with release, it's going to apply a bunch of optimizations, which takes a bunch of time. And what this will let you do is say um, for this dependency or this set of dependencies like, like build scripts or proc macros, uh, as Ben mentioned, mentioned, I don't want to do optimizations because they don't matter. So even if I compile in release mode, I don't want to optimize those libraries. Um, and this might buy you a bunch of, uh, basically, it might give you cargo build performance for some of your dependencies, even though you're building with a release without any real cost to your final binary. The other use case for this, which is what got me a bit excited, is to do it the other way around, where imagine that you have some library and you depend on a library uh, that just like is extremely slow in the default debug mode. Um, and so if you run your test suite and you build this dependency in debug mode, your test suite just takes forever. Examples of this are things that do like compression, encryption, dealing with image files, that sort of stuff, where you really just always want to compile them in release mode, even if you're doing a debug build, because otherwise your debug build is just going to be horribly slow to run. Um, and so here you can now do that with these profile overrides as well. You can say like profile.dev, which is like the, the default development build, dot package dot uh, compression handling library and set op level equals three. And now it will be built to be fast. And then all the other code will still be built quickly and in debug mode. Um, and so this is a really nice way to sort of customize your build so that the things that need to be fast are built slowly so that they're fast, and the things that can be slow are built quickly and are slow to run. Mm -hmm. 
so I think that's all for our release notes this time. So um, I had one more actually oh, yeah? that I uh, I found while, while scrolling through the infinite list of changes, which is you can now arbitrarily nest receiver types in the self position. Now this is a little bit weird. Um, s- some of you might be aware that in addition to be able to write methods uh, for impl blocks to say like ref self or ref mute self or just take ownership of self, you can also write self colon and then some type that dereferences to self. And the prime example of this is a uh, pin that some of you might be aware of, right? You can write um, fn poll self colon pin re- mutable reference to self. Um, and previously you could do this with other types as well. You could say, you could implement a, a method for your type or that's like self colon box self. So that method would only be callable if the caller has a box of your type. Um, as this might be handy, where in certain certain cases you might want to have this restriction, um, but previously you could only go one type deep. So you could say self colon arc self, self colon box self. Um, now you can nest these arbitrarily. You can do things like self colon arc box rc ref cell self. Hopefully not. You wouldn't need that. But I think a better use case is like you know maybe a pin mute self. So pin mute example. self you could already do, but now you can do like box pin self, mm-hmm. uh, which you could not previously do. We should note that these types still all have to be uh, types from the standard library. You can't have arbitrary self receiver types for um, types that are implemented outside of the standard library. Uh, although that I think is coming under a feature flag. It's definitely uh, an RFC for. I think the kind of like impetus for getting the initial implementation out was for pin for having any kind of arbitrary self type, and then. I think I'm not sure if like the pin like ampersand mute self was like a hard coded thing just for pin itself because of the design of the feature the the features trait. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so now it is it is gradually becoming uh, more it, or less and less hard coded, less and less special cased. So hopefully it should come eventually. Yeah, and the the reason this is neat is imagine that um, you implement like some hyper optimized reference counted type. Um, then currently it's sort of it's not that ergonomic to use. Whereas once this lands, you could actually have this sort of self of your arc uh, self and have that just work. Uh, So that's something to watch out for um, in the future, maybe one day. That, I think, is everything I had. All right. Uh, I want to yet again thank the people who volunteer their time to edit these episodes. We, uh, We are eternally indebted to you. Uh, and I also want to thank Ben for all the great Rustfest interviews. It's been really fun to listen to. We still have to like seven more to edit. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'm excited to hear all of They're them. They're coming out. They're not going to be you know, super uh, timely, but these things take time, especially when you're on a volunteer basis. Hey, speaking of, again, another call to action, as we mentioned before. Uh, if you want to come like edit these, any background at all in audio editing, which I guess I don't, maybe John does, but also John has no time for that. John's got pretty busy. He's got some secret projects he was telling me about that. Uh, you wish you could hear about. Oh, oh the secrets. Mm, it feels so good to know things that no one else knows. <laughs> In any case, if you want to help out, come uh, follow those links to any of our Twitter, Discord, etc. And just give us a hail, and then we'll throw an audio file at you, and you toss it back to us after it's edited, and then we'll just put it up and put your name in the credits. And you also get to hear the episode before That's anyone true. else. You still want other secrets. Yeah, exactly. John's it's all secret. terrible, dark secrets. That's right. That's right. They're very <laughs> deep, deep inside. Um, and on that note, uh, we will, uh, I guess, speak again next release in what six, six weeks? Yeah, see Is it six in, weeks? It's always six weeks. Of course. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe Rust has his own <laughs> schedule. <laughs> I mean, Firefox did move to a four-week release schedule. Oh, that's true. So, I mean, hopefully, God, I don't want to go to a four-week release <laughs> schedule. That's that's too much. Even six weeks is pushing it. So. <laughs> oh, I guess one thing we didn't talk about was the the Rust 2020 roadmap, which was released. Oh, yeah. um, sure. It's on. I think it's an RFC still, but I mean. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, but also it's kind of a. In this case, it is a. They're trying to set fewer concrete goals for themselves because people tend to get like you know. It's hard to guarantee that any given thing will get done because there are so many things that are being done on a volunteer basis. You can't just be like you're fired if you don't get this done. Like no, you're a volunteer. Like what are we gonna do? So yeah. uh, in this case, it's kind of like again polishing up various things in previous years. Uh, but then you should, you should go read it. We'll leave, add a link to it in the release notes here. Yeah, I, I think I was a, I was a big fan of the direction they chose for for this year. Even though it's relatively high level, I think it's a it's a good direction to target. Mm-hmm. 
And with that, I guess we're signing off again. And yep. there, there's no futures away, no. away pun this no. time. It's very sad. Oh, well, goodbye then. Yeah, I guess we'll see. <laughs>